Welcome to the latest edition of Broadcasting Today. Our guest this afternoon is Suzanne Moore, a columnist for The Guardian, among other newspapers, all part of our mission here at Middlesex University London to teach students how to think, but also, more importantly, how to do. Welcome to the latest edition of Broadcasting Today. And today we have a columnist from The Guardian, Suzanne Moore. Welcome, Suzanne, or should I say, of course, welcome back. Mm -hmm. Because once upon a time, you too were at Middlesex uh, in the old days up at Trent Park, I believe. What, um, um, what got you into journalism? What attracted you to it? Uh, well, there were a couple of things. I was, um, when I finished my degree, at Middle I was at Middlesex Poly, um, and I started doing a thesis, and I got really frustrated by the idea that I was doing all this work and only two people in the world were ever going to read it. <laughs> so I started doing, at that time, and we're talking about sort of 25 years ago, there were lots of little left-wing magazines and feminist magazines, and I started doing bits and pieces for them, and I realised that I liked talking to people in a less academic way, maybe, and, and also to sort of popularise some of those ideas. And the other thing that attracted me, you know, attraction is a wrong word. I mean, I was getting paid for it. <laughs> and I realised that I could start to, you know, make some money from it. Necessity being the mother of invention. Definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I'm Bonnie, by the way, I'm a journalism student. Um, and I was wondering, how did your degree prepare you? Did it prepare you in any way for the career in writing that you've had? I think it did in some ways because I think a good degree should you should come out at the end and be able to write an essay definitely you know what how to structure an essay and because I had done quite a lot of film studies one of the first regular gigs I got is I was a film critic I was a film critic for the New Statesman and that gave me the rhythm of writing every week but also mm -hmm. a lot of what I was bringing to that column was the cultural studies and the film studies that I had done at Middlesex which at the time were, you know, not everybody knew about it. It was, you know, I was lucky. I was there at the right time. Um, and people wanted to talk about film in a kind of more in-depth way than, you know, just four or five stars. And that column gave me the space to do that. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, I got a job editing. And there's nothing that makes you realise you want to write more than editing other people's writing. <laughs> because then you see, actually, um, because the, the creative part of editing is commissioning and thinking who who should I get to do this um, and then you get it in and if I think if you're a natural editor you you know you're you're thrilled at what you've got and you've got the right person the, the right idea and if you're a natural writer you'll be thinking no I could have done that mm -hmm. and once you start thinking I could have done that then maybe that's what it's you should the time to start writing yourself yeah you had to be quite entrepreneurial though didn't you you already described it in a way that you did a bit for this person a bit for that person yeah you a bit of editing, a bit of writing. You had to be quite entrepreneurial to get yourself started. You do, and I think one of the things that you... Simple bits of advice that I would just say to anybody who is starting out is just to listen to what the people that you work for tell you. I know that sounds really obvious, but they will tell you... Uh, they will give you feedback. So if you've done a piece and they say... They were saying to me very early on... Oh, it's great to have this really strong opinionated stuff from a woman. <laughs> and, you know, um, and I heard that. Because and when I was editing, I could see that lots of women were, you know, quite tentative in their opinion and didn't want to be out there and didn't want to be disliked. And I kind of knew that I could do that. Um, but, yeah, you do have to... And you sort of just have to do what you're told, I mean, what you're asked for. If you, If someone says can you do me 600 words on this? They don't really want 1,200 words, you know? Mm -hmm. So they come back to you if you give them... And it's really basic, but so many... Much of the time when I was an editor, I would ask for so many words, and they would send me double. Well, no, you're just going to make my life you know, more difficult. I will use the person who just does the thing that I have asked for. Um, and it's just... No one, want, no one wants to read, you know... 
if they've asked you for a thousand words, they don't secretly want your entire life story that you've been <laughs> dying to tell them. They don't want it. Don't give it to them. Is that still the case now? You're a star columnist. That you have to give them twelve hundred words, or yeah. can you give them fifteen or sixteen hundred? It's the same. It's the same, and I can, you know, and I wouldn't. Um, I would never expect anyone to clear space. Except it's with certain editors that you trust, they might say you might have this conversation where they say, "How long do you think this piece should be?" And I will say twelve hundred, maybe fourteen hundred. And then negotiate, yeah. But I mean, I'm I'm always I always like to get it as short as possible. Mm -hmm. And speaking about um, column writing, um, in traditional journalism, journalists kind of have the responsibility to be objective and impartial. Mm. But in column writing, you have the freedom to talk about your own opinions. Um, does that come with its own responsibilities and its own challenges? Or yeah, I mean, it's. In some ways, I mean, you're, you're accountable to yourself, you're accountable to the reader, um, and now in a digital age, you're accountable to the entire internet. So, you know, if you say something that somebody doesn't like, you know, they're certainly going to tell you about it. And, and also, if you mis the other bit of that is if you make a mistake, you just need to say right away, I've made a mistake, I apologise, because everybody now can check facts so quickly. And we're, we are working very fast sometimes. Mm -hmm. I mean... My copy might go in at six o'clock and it'll be online at eight o'clock. And that's quite a quick turnaround. So say there's something in it that's wrong or and someone finds, you know, points that out, then it's just best to say, no, no, mm -hmm. screwed that one up. Um, and it happens. It happens to everybody all the time. Didn't happen in your piece today, presumably. No, no, I don't think so. Not today. No, no. <laughs> no, one's, no one's complained yet. No, no. But I mean, <laughs> um, but the thing about being accountable is because The Guardian now has, you know, everybody can comment underneath mm -hmm. I think people understand most people understand it's your opinion and then you make the argument and you back it up as you can and certain people will read you uh, because they because they don't like your opinion and mm -hmm. you represent to them something horrible like when I was at the mail on Sunday a man used to write every week and say to my editor if she's in the paper again this week I'm never you know I'm never gonna buy it again and I said, oh, God. And he used to say, it means he's going to buy the paper that next week. And the first page he's going to turn to is yours, because that's how it works. Mm -hmm. you know, so. But we don't, you know, we don't go to columnists, I think, for complete objectivity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard at the moment with so many big news stories as well to find that. But there's not yeah. challenges, aren't there, in mm. using your own opinion in writing? Mm. I mean, it's not... I mean, if you're just going into the business you might say that's the kind of job I want but of course you're not going to get there no. on day one or week one or year one even because it takes a certain level of expertise and judgment to actually start expressing your opinion in public in that way. What are the challenges of that? Well there are different kinds of columns right I mean even if you're doing a political column you could be based at Westminster you could be writing about Westminster politics I think that is going in a way because one of the reasons that we're all disillusioned with that kind of journalism and those kind of politics is because it's become a very small club politicians and journalists are too close mm -hmm. so I would describe the kind of thing I do as you know I've, I've been down to Westminster I have hung out with them sometimes and all that kind of thing go to conference and again you see how close that that world is so one of the things I do or try not to do is I'm not really part of that club so I will come at it from a slightly different point of view and my politics are left and their culture politics or they'll be about feminism and sometimes I'll bring that to it uh, sometimes I'll just come in from a piece of personal experience and widen it out but some of it is a kind of um, it's about voice and instinct a column and um, you know we all just have people that we we want to know what they think or I mean, I often mm -hmm. read people that I don't agree with, you know. I mean, Matthew Paris is a brilliant, brilliant columnist. He's, he was a Tory MP. You know, he doesn't share my politics, but I would read what he wrote always, you know. And it, it's just, that's... Mm. How much do you think in your mind when you're writing or pursuing a story about the audience, about the reader? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's well. That's obviously because I've worked in different papers. You do because you have an ideal 
they always say you have an idealised reader in your head. So everybody knows what a Guardian reader is, you know, knit your own yoghurt, all that. Um, <laughs> everybody knows what a Mail on Sunday reader is. When I worked at The Independent, no one had a bloody clue who the reader was. That's part of the problem for that paper, because you didn't know who you were writing to. Except I always thought it was a vicar, because a lot of vicars used to write to me. But it, <laughs> the things that succeed are the things where people do have an identity. So as much as I say I don't think about the reader, I do, I do of course, and that I can say different things in the New Statesman. I can assume a level of political knowledge mm. that I could not assume if mm. I was writing in a tabloid. The, I the idea that writing a shorter piece or writing tabloid-style journalism is easier, mm. it's just not true. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. I know there's a myth, they always say the Sun could edit the Guardian, the Guardian couldn't edit the Sun. There's that, there's a lot of, there is a lot of truth in that. It is much harder to do those little 200 word pieces than to just wang on for like a thousand mm -hmm. words. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done it and I know. It's, it's, there's such a kind of snobbery around uh, tabloid journalism, but good tabloid journalism, I, you know, I would always stand up for. Do you find it tempting to use your personal life and your personal anecdotes? I know you have children, and a lot of column writers That's are known I had, for why kind I of. I had children so that I could. What's <laughs> 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 yeah. And in some ways, doing that does enrich columns and it mm. does make it um, easier to connect with the audience. Do you yeah. find that something that. Yeah, do, I mean, there's al there are always going to be stories that when they, when they happen, you're going to connect it to your own personal experience. and. Actually, it's funny because you know some. Sometimes my kids say, "Oh, don't, oh, don't, please don't say anything about that," and, and, you know. And I don't, I don't. I run them. They're old, and they don't. I run stuff by them. But um, yeah, I do. I. I don't. I don't just write about myself, kind of because I want a mirror or it's a narcissistic thing. It is to connect it to a wider political mm -hmm. thing. You know, if the issue is single parents I know about that you know if the mm. issue you know it's there are, there are always going to be big social issues that you can find a way in through a personal connection if you can make the reader identif identify with you in certain ways then you maybe can sort of slide in some other things that they they, they didn't necessarily mm -hmm. want to hear so yeah it, it, it's but I don't I don't really like just what's, what has happened with journalism, which is, you know, the endless confession of columns. You know. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Me either. So where I is the line the where between using personal anecdotes and then going too far and it being a confessional piece? That well, Liz Jones. Anyone knows who she is. But, I mean, the I think it's whether you anyone's life is interesting enough to warrant a, a weekly almost mm -hmm. seems like daily doesn't it sort of self-examination um i think there are certain people who can write almost about anything and they're just interesting uh but i think as a journalist i mean if you're going to call yourself a journalist you need and, you, and your subject is yourself yourself mm -hmm. maybe maybe you're not so much of a journalist i mean it's all about looking at other people and listening to what they say and so you use your experience to connect with someone else, not just to talk about, about yourself. Do you find it helps? I mean, I've got three children like you, and sometimes I've found it helpful to understand where, when I'm trying to inform myself about a, <laughs> uh, a problem, I've, well, I think, well, I've been there so I can empathise with the subject of the story, perhaps. And you can bring that to the, the story, so to speak, without wearing your heart on your sleeve yeah, in your output. Yeah, I mean... You know, anyone who's been a parent of a teenager will have sympathy for, you know, the whole idea that, you know, they're off in their rooms and everyone's on the screens. And, you know, you don't need to be told all this stuff all the time. It's just how, how people how people live, the fragmentation of family life, all these things, you know, they're just part of how we live. I don't mean you have to have children, but I think, I think they do. I think just being around other people who have different experiences to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, for, for instance, my, my youngest one, you know, I know that sort of it really matters. What really matters to her is nothing that she sees on TV. It's all YouTube, and it would be Zoella or whoever. Mm -hmm. And when people say, "Oh, why aren't teenage magazines selling?" It's they're finished. You know, they're all they're gone. It's on YouTube. You know, you you, you just see it mm -hmm. through your children. What's happening? 
-hmm. You don't need to have a great analysis of it. You know, you can just see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, yeah. Yeah, I do use, I use them as sort of fodder, but I mean, it's not really there. It's not the reason you had children. <laughs> <laughs> In the past, you've um, you've dabbled with politics. Mm. I mean, how much of an overlap do you think there is, or should there be, between politics and journalism? I mean, can politics even survive without journalism in the modern age? Yeah, that's a really that's a really difficult question, isn't it? I mean, and many would argue that U UKIP wouldn't have risen, for instance, without the amount of media attention. Mm that mm. Farage has got. Um, they're symbiotic, they feed off each other. I personally was, you know, when I first went to The Guardian many, many years ago, was shocked at how close those relationships were. Uh, we didn't need the Leveson inquiry to tell us how close politicians are to, to journalists and the police, you know. It, it was all there if anyone had wanted to see that. Mm. But for, for some reason, people chose not to see it. Uh, the establishment, if you like, you know, these people did go to the same schools. People move very easily between uh, press and, and politics, PR people. I mean, who's the guy who was um, the Express political editor? Then he becomes an MEP for mm. Farage. And I mean, they all they all they all move between it. So I think it's better. I think it should be. If I was in charge tomorrow, for instance, I would ban the lobby system, the lobby system in Westminster, by which you know you have to be accredited, and only certain people have read stories. When I first went to West Westminster, when I was much younger, the political editor told me to just stand in, you know, the central hall at Westminster and wear a short skirt and hope that somebody gave you a story. Yeah. Was that a useful tip? Oh, no, of course, it's absolutely. You know, it's just that's how it. It's just. <laughs> It's like you haven't got a brain. You couldn't work out that, you know, you could go and talk to these people. But it that was how it worked at Westminster for, for a long while. I mean, it is a very much a boys' club. Mm. Mm. It's less so now, but it was. Um, but they have their favourite journalists. And the, the era of New Labour and Alistair Campbell, well, you know, I mean, it all operated by sort of favours. If you said anything against New Labour, then Alistair Campbell wasn't going to feature a story. When I, when I went from the Independent to the Mail on Sunday, because the Mail on Sunday is, had such a big reach, uh, I had incredible access to politicians because they all want the Mail to love them. Of course they do. Sure. It's, a, sure. it's a big paper and it's the swing vote that got Blair in. So when I was at the Mail on Sunday, there wasn't a politician that would not come to lunch with the editor. Um, it was, uh, I mean... Is it shocking, or do you already know it? I don't think people get the amount of contact there is between those people. It's a bit too close for comfort in your book. It's way too close. You can't have, you can't have somebody, you know, you can't have the editor of a newspaper being screamed at on the phone by Alastair Campbell because we, someone like me is suddenly about <laughs> Tony Blair or whatever it is. But they do it. They do it. I mean, they want, they, you know, it's a, they want to have spin their stories but obviously now with Cameron and Coulson you know and we've seen that how close it is there's a there's an attempt to distance mm -hmm. but it's way too close you've touched on it already but could you tell us more about your experience of being a woman both in politics and also in journalism um, I think just just like anything else, certain assumptions are made about the kind of things you're going to write and how you're going to write them. And uh, certainly when I was younger, I mean, I think we were talking about it earlier. There are lots of different skills in journalism. Some people are brilliant columnists. Some people are fantastic interviewers. Some people are great reporters. Um, they're, all, they're not interchangeable skills. I mean, it's good to have them, as many as you can have. <laughs> Some people can write a great feature, whatever, but they're not. But you get pushed as a woman to in, to do interviews, actually, because they always say, oh, Suzanne, you're a people person. Go off and interview that, whoever it is. And they always used to give me actors and actresses. And oh, I think, oh, yeah, do you know what? There's no, I'm just, I don't care. <laughs> I'm just like, so I don't really think often that actors say very interesting things, apart from it's really hot on a film set or it's really difficult or whatever it was, you know. There's a few that do, but <laughs> not many. To me, they're not, they're not interesting. Directors are interesting, of course, you see, because it's their ideas. But, you know, 
So they would offer you these people, and then you'd go, no, I don't really want to. Um, and I think it was just because I was a woman that they were mm. sort of pushing me. And then I, so I had to sort of, you have to kind of make a stand about, no, I'm going, to, I want to do that, or I want to do politics. And the first time I went to the Labour Party conference, <laughs> and I wrote a piece, and I know this is, sounds ridiculous, but I said, I indicated that Peter Madison was gay, because, well, it, he is. <laughs> and, uh, um, and it wasn't like some great thing that I'd worked out magically. I mean, I didn't know... You see, that again, that was a secret. You weren't allowed at that time to say that in a newspaper. So the political ed editor of The Guardian went to the editor of The Guardian and said, she must never be allowed to go near politics. Said, because I'd outed Peter Madison, who everybody already <laughs> knew was gay. Any it was just ridiculous things, anyway, like that. But, it, yeah, it, it's very, very boys' clubby. It's changed. It's changed a lot um, in the last 20 years. A lot, lot more... Wi um, women editors. The digital stuff has been really good for women, actually. Uh, we've got a lot of young, younger women coming in. Their skills are fantastic. You know, there's mm -hmm. not, the, the divide isn't quite there in the same way it was, I think. I noticed over the years the tonality of newsrooms changing the more women that came in. Yeah. Not necessarily having a woman in charge, but having women involved in the conversations, in the editorial conversations, change the tonality of those conversations and I think that's really misunderstood about you know public discourse and actually how important it is to have women I mean sh presumably that's a side of journalism you would like to see reinforced but it's, a, it, it's also what used to be called women's issues actually just became the issues there was a time when things like health and education were considered women's issues I know that the real men's issues are uh, well still, it's the economy, it's war, you know, it's, yeah. uh, so if you wanted to write about education, that was a seen as a soft issue, mm -hmm. and that's where you had your women reporters, um, and, and it's changed because those, a lot of those issues, when people just became much more aware that you had to, this isn't done out of any great political, you know, uh, awareness, it's done because you have to have women readers, mm. actually, you know, and so, if you if you can't interest them in stuff in their daily lives, you know mm -hmm. whether it's you're writing about schools or hospitals or whatever it is, um, you can always have a mix. You know you can have the assumption that someone is interested in celebrities and the NHS. Well, you know it's not either or. It, we can all be both, and those are the things that work best at the moment that manage to do both. Well, uh, you know, in a sense, the insight that comes into a newsroom through diversity. I mean, you know, I sat in newsrooms for nearly 25 years being the only person of colour and being frankly amazed at some of the foolishness that was presented as common sense in those newsrooms. And I'm sure you've experienced that too, but I see a shift. That it's slow. I mean, in terms of sort of ethnic diversity, it's slow and it, you can, I can see it. I can see people be getting really, really frustrated with it now. And I don't. I think that's that's right. I mean, oh God, yeah. I mean, there are so many assumptions. Like uh, Peter Preston, who was the editor of the Guardian before Alan Musbridge, took me out once and said that he said it must be so nice being a lady columnist. What is a lady columnist? <laughs> um, he said because if you can't think of anything to say, I mean, you could just write about painting your toenails. I just thought well, nobody you know, read it. I mean, Gosh. God Almighty, you know, <laughs> really, really, Peter, you know, come on, you know, um, and then. So there's, yeah, just you get patronised. You're patronised because you're a woman. You're patronised because you didn't go to Oxford. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've had guys just, I mean, like Middlesex Polly. I still call it Middlesex Polly because it was when I was here. And I've had so many conversations with people at The Guardian. This is the great and good of British journalism where they say, and where did you go to college? And I say Middlesex Polly. And they just, something happens, they can't hear that. <laughs> and, then, and then they just kind of reel off a list of sort of Oxford and Cambridge colleges where I go, no, 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 no. And then they go, where? And then I tell them again. <laughs> and then they sort of, sort of oh. And then I always remember one of them saying to me, I can't remember who it was, Middlesex Polytechnic. I said, yes. <laughs> he said, oh. So that's where you get this extraordinary view of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to him, well, it can't.
can't be that extraordinary. Otherwise, no one would want to read it. But you know, so it's still, it is still, it is still like politics. It's still very Oxbridge dominated. Less so on the tabloids. Um, more men than women. Diversity issues. It, it, it's changing, but it's it's slow. The big de debate at the moment, of which you've been a part, obviously, is the killings in Paris mm. and the way in which the Charlie Hebdo um, pictures of the Prophet Muhammad mm. um, challenge the way we think about freedom of speech. What do you think students can learn from that debate? Because it's, a, it's, it's almost a touchstone debate, isn't it, about what it is that we actually do. What are we here for? Does it matter? Yeah, um, God, I mean, it's such it's such a big issue and it divided so quickly on the day itself. I mean, my reaction, my reaction, and I had to write a column an hour after that happened. Um, I would have said something different if I'd written it six hours later and again the next day. And I, I read a very long piece, I think it was Frank uh, Misha and The Guardian, and that I thought was very good. And... Um, probably arguing the opposite to what I had argued, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is I'm still thinking about it. Uh, the, the kind of universal gut feeling for journalists was free speech, sort of at all costs. Um, the reflection that comes later is, no, we are, actually, we are living in, if we're going to live alongside people, uh, other people who believe different things, then, you know, we have to except that possibly, you know, that these cartoons were offensive. I, com I came out on the side, they're not offensive because we don't have a blasphemy law, we live in a secular society, that would be my line. I understand what the opposite arguments are. Um, but certainly, it was, a, it, was a, it was something where I had to go into the office the next day. People felt that very much, but it wasn't... Because I think because the two guys who shot the cartoonists and editors named them, called them out, knew who they wanted to, mm. to, to kill, uh, and I'm and I suppose and, and I'm close to people like Martin Rosen and Steve Bell who produced cartoons the whole time and tread a very fine line. Mm. And often, of course, I think a great cartoon is better than any any piece of, of writing. But um, I think uh, you know I think the, re the repercussions are still there. I think the, the second lot of shootings when they went into the kosher supermarket then change that dynamic again. So it wasn't ju then just about free mm -hmm. speech and journalism. Mm. You could be shot for what you did, but you could be shot for just who you are. You are. Mm. Mm. And so then that then changes it. Uh, certainly I know at The Guardian, the, the debate on the night, and there was a live debate on the night, broke up really into, it was nothing like sort of any cl a cl clash of civilizations, but People who had faith, whatever their faith was, whether they were Jewish, whether they were Muslim, whether they were Christian, were much more sympathetic to the idea that these things were blasphemous for mm -hmm. people who weren't. That's how it sort mm -hmm. of seemed to break down on the day, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think we were all still talking about it. Um, but the fact is, we they did, nearly everybody saw the Charlie Hebdo cover the next, um, the next week and the reaction in France was Massive, and I'd just been in Berlin and seen that you know the rise of uh, Pegida. Pegida. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so we've got all these things going on. It's a very complicated uh, process. But free speech, yes. I mean, I, I, w I, w I wouldn't. I mean, I'm against the Royal Charter. I was against what was going on in Leveson. I do. I don't think. I do believe in a free press. I don't believe the state should interfere with what journalists do, and that means that we will have some pretty rough and tumble stuff that I probably don't like. But yes, that's that's where I would always down. So gratuitous offence may just be part and parcel yeah. what we do. Yeah, mm. I think so. Um, yeah. Um, so as students, what can we learn from, I mean, you were saying about how after a few days you might have written something completely different from, well, may maybe not completely different, yeah. but slightly different in some ways, because you kind of had a reflection from when you first published something. What can students going into the industry learn from um, the way stories develop, especially in the, the digital age that we live in where they develop so quickly and you get hundreds of opinions coming out at the same time? Yeah, I think, what can you learn? I guess in some ways people like me, my job, you know, 
sometimes I think, well, it can't possibly last. <laughs> but because there are so many opinions all the time, people do look to sort of people they trust. Mm -hmm. So you are looking to build up trust, trust yeah, with yeah. with the reader. Now, that doesn't mean that everything you say every week they're going to agree with or you're going to be right. But I think a good relationship with a reader is somewhere you get it, you have more good weeks than bad weeks. So they mm -hmm. think, yeah, that's someone, I think they'll give me either something that I agree with or sum it up for me or explain something to me or make me think it in a different way. Um, but, if, but, when you're, but when you're start, when you're starting out, people aren't going to ask you to sort of sum up the whole of the free speech debate. That's mm -hmm. not the sort of thing you'd be asked to do. Mm -hmm. what, so what, what, you do, what you do need to be able to do actually is, is summarise arguments very quickly. The stuff that you are learning just in basic essay writing is, is understand very quickly what's happening. You know, people today, you know, this morning, everybody, if you're on a newspaper this morning, okay, everybody would have expected you to know not just about Syriza, but the other parties in Greece, what the likelihood of that coalition will be, who they will be talking to, how fast that government will, will form. They will expect you to know about what George Osborne has said on fracking this morning, what Mandelson has said. I'm just, just running through it in my head, like if I had been there. By lunchtime, though, you would need to know whether the Kurds have taken Kobani, for instance. I'm, you'd also then have to have your light stories. You'd have to know what's going on in the theatre, what's going on in the arts, you know, and be looking for some th coming in at a tangent. So you've really got to keep your eye on the ball, and things are changing the whole time. Some people will want to know what's happening in New York, a big storm is coming. So you're going to be looking for a whole mixture of news things a whole time. Mm -hmm. So you have your one thing that you focus on, but you really need to, to know about what's, what's happening in the world. Um, you don't have to know all of it because there's, you know, there's the internet, so you can always you know, find out. The, but you have to, like, you can't now. I mean, there were... I think people were lazy. There were times when people would walk into an editorial meeting and go, you tell me what's happening. Mm. That isn't like that now. You're expected to know. I can't, ring up, I can't ring up the Guardian and go, oh, I don't know what's in the news. I mean, I have to know. Um, that's, that's, so my work, my work is not writing. Mm -hmm. My work is knowing what's happening and having the ideas and seeing how to. The, the writing bit is like the least bit of my work, I think. I mean, you talk about this encyclopedic knowledge almost you have to have if you're going to hold it, hold it. I no, know you super, can, I'm you saying can, it very superficially. No, no, I know, but you can draw on those sources yeah. to reinforce yeah. that knowledge. Yeah. But in a way, more crucially, as third-year students think about the world of work, one thing when we mentioned it earlier that they're going to have to think about is being far more entrepreneurial. And, of course, the whole business is becoming yeah. much more fragile, fragmented, and freelance, yeah. um, that's quite a challenge, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you're really going to have to work hard now to work within that, those parameters of being a freelance and building up a portfolio, building reputation, hopefully building trust, mm -hmm. in much more than we had to do when we started out 30 years yeah, ago. Yeah, I think so. One of the tools you've got is social media, though. Um, people are able to make good contacts on Facebook, Twitter, all the other ones. I, I've, I've really seen it work. I've, I've seen people come in and often with a specialism. I think, I think it's always, I would always say to, to, to students, you know, you're not going to be good at everything. Why not try to be sort of good at one thing? I think editors are very suspicious of people who say, I can write about anything. I mean, but if you say, no, actually my thing is, Cricket, my thing is film, my thing, whatever the thing, it doesn't matter what it is, but start from a specialism mm. or, or, mm. or an interest or a passion. People do like, people like people who have a, have a passion for whatever it is. So come on with that. And I've seen people, like I have a friend who's a food writer. Her thing is Catalan cooking. She has, by using Twitter, I have seen her in the last few years, built a career. Mm. Because she contacts the chefs, she contacts people who are interested in food, she contacts restaurants. She's very open, she's very friendly, she gets people together. She does co cookery classes. And, you know, she's just really made, she's, she's very entrepreneurial, but, yeah, she mm -hmm. uses it. So, so if somebody, if, if you get offered a chance to do something, then obviously you want it to be 
retweeted as much as possible, mm -hmm. shared on Facebook, all these things. I mean, there isn't a, a you know there isn't a newspaper that can't manage without those things now. Mm -hmm. So you you can use that. You also want to be um, available. To, so so if somebody says you know you have got an hour to write this, though you have, I'm afraid you just have to say yes, I can do it. You might feel sick. It doesn't mean. <laughs> But you just have to say, yes, I can do it. And then you just have to front it out, basically. But, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trade for the bold. No, you, do, you know, you just put the phone and think, oh, fuck. But, I mean, you, you, <laughs> but you, but you do it because they're going to want the person who says yes. You, you can't say, oh, well, I really, you know, need another sort of th three months to research. It isn't <laughs> like that. You've got to be, be able to to be quick and also sometimes look at what's m not in the paper and not in a magazine what aren't they covering and why not and what you could do and sort of see the gaps you know and see how you could fill them but but I do I think there's a lot of um, I mean a lot of the stuff that gets into papers now does come via people's blogs as well mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you can say I, and I know that's difficult because there's no money in blogging and even successful blogging you know even when people are known as bloggers they're not making that much money, but it is. If you can do it and you can keep maintain, it's a way to get to get going. I think. Let's have some questions from out here. Anybody got any questions for us, for Suzanne? Yes. Um, <coughs> just so that they, that they might come yeah. into you, just to grab your answer. Um, you touched on it briefly there. Um, what do you see the future of newspapers being? As um, you just said, like newspapers need social media mm. well how many people are, are buying a newspaper rather than just going on like a BBC News app on their phone um, well nobody really knows the answer to that obviously the future is digital you know whether I think print will go um, print will go I should think within the next five years mm. I think it'll be fairly niche there'll always be some people who want a copy of a newspaper just like people want to read you know books as opposed to reading on, on the Kindle, but it's pretty niche. I mean, The Guardian, for instance, is not that interested in, in the print. You can see it. You can see it. I'm sorry to say this, uh, but you can tell it's all about um, digital, but there's no money in it. So it's how then to extend the revenue. Ads aren't working very well uh, because people are reading on phones. Ads aren't getting the click through unt until we have another model. The only other model has been Murdoch's paywall. When the Times went into, you know, a sort of balance, everyone went, is the Guardian going to put up a paywall? Um, my journalist colleagues, I mean, uh, we're, we're very split about this. I think you have to pay for journalism, just like you have to pay for music, just like you have to pay for, you know. Um, but it's very hard when someone, when we've had stuff for free to get people to pay. One of the things that the Guardian is doing at the moment is trying to extend its digital out into life by having a membership scheme so you can go and see people and have discussions and you know that will bring in a certain amount of revenue but the the future of I don't think newspapers are going to go away uh, and I don't think journalism is going to go away and there's always going to be a need for it but it uh, the number of young people who buy newspapers is just tiny everybody is reading online um, I've I used to have, have every newspaper every day myself, and I don't, you know, I mean, it's just happened, it's just happened, so, um, but the more information there is, the more need there is for good journalism, I mean, it's, so it's, it's not going to go, but it's how we finance it, and that's the sort of great holy grail, and it's what we all want people to be able to tell us, because the journalism that finances itself, the click-through stuff, which, you know, should I have Botox, am I too, you know, the daily, the ma Mail online, okay, that's a yeah, sidebar of shame. That's one model. <laughs> that's not going to finance people to go out to Syria. You know, so if we're only going to finance the journalism that just is easy to read um, and you can sell ad revenue on, you know, we'll lose a lot. Um, so I'm suggesting that, yeah, we probably will have to have some subscription or some sort of pay more model, but nobody at The Guardian will um, say that at the moment. So... Otherwise, it's Murdoch, isn't it? Otherwise, you or you've got the independent owned by uh, you know, oligarchs, or it's a vanity project to have a newspaper now, isn't it? <laughs> I'm just interested to know a little 
bit more. You mentioned briefly on the Leveson inquiry and your sort of feelings about it or stand on it. Um, whilst that whole process was going on and once the ruling came out, did you feel amongst your network and your colleagues, did you feel things change? Was there a divide or how was the sort of mood around that? Um, there was all there were all kinds of divides. There was a very uh, angry divide between tabloids against the Guardian, who they think instigated, you know, the the, the Nick Davis report that instigated the phone hacking claims. There was a divide between people who think that yes, actually, a lot of the press has gone too far and has been really mean, and you know, it's not just about celebrities. You know, it's about how it's affected real people. And then I found myself on the side of kind of much more libertarian side, really. So I was on the same side as people from The Spectator because I don't believe in legislation and also because I think there wasn't a moment during Leveson, however long that went on for, where he ever, ever, ever understood that newspapers are a commercial enterprise and you have to sell them and, and that the internet exists. So any ruling that Leveson was ever going to make was all was never going to be anything that could be applied. So I I found it really you know there were some interesting bits like when you know when the women came in and talked about how they'd been objectified and you thought oh well, that's good that's good and, you know, some of these issues are there are issues that I would like to see more publicly aired, but it, it was like you know watching to me it was like watching those judges who say you know who who are the Beatles is it a popular beat combo. He doesn't. He didn't. They none of the none of these lawyers understand that newspapers aren't. They're not. It's not the NHS. You know, they don't come out of taxpayers' money. People have to buy them, and we have to sell them. So you, you know, as the minute you get some somebody like Richard Desmond who goes basically, you know, sod you. I'm never going to sign up to it. What are you going to do about those sorts of people? They're never going to sign up to it. And what? At the same time, you're trying to rule on a on a dying medium because you've got all your news online. And you've got things that all the every kind every time there's a ban on naming someone, for instance, the footballers you know who've had affairs and things, everybody knows who it is because you just go to another site that's not based in England or libel. I mean, you can just get round it by basing your company somewhere else. So it it felt to me like some of the some of the complaints that people had about the press, which were completely legitimate and, and right. Um, Sort of got lost in a kind of bashing the entire, you know, the uh, the, ta the tabloids and, and not really thinking about how to regulate. There were, I mean, like I said, I think you could regulate quite simply. You could, if you stop the political lobby, you know, you could break up. You've got the police, the journalists, and the press. At the centre of that, you've got the police. Most of the big stories that people have really enjoyed reading over the last sort of twenty years. Uh, how did they think? people, you know, the crime stuff. Mm -hmm. Where did you all think that came from? <laughs> do you think, how do you think that happened? You know, of course people have paid the police. I mean, it doesn't take, like, and these are stories that people have, you know. And is it necessary that the police can sometimes go to a journalist and tell them stuff? Yes. Is it necessary for whistleblowers to come and say, this is going on in my company? Yes. Is it necessary to pay people sometimes for stories? Yes, it is. Is it necessary to listen to their private voicemails? Well, this is where we get into the, you know, the, it's obviously not he wrong, you know, but you mustn't do that, you know. But <laughs> all, of the, all, of, all, of, all of that stuff. Um, but I just, I, I felt like I was watching something. That it, the minute the Leveson report came out, it was already dead. It couldn't be, there were, you know, it's such a waste of money. But I do, that, that's not to say there aren't loads of things wrong. There are. But that wasn't the way to do it for me. One last question. women's rights and how it came out through the Leveson inquiry. Mm. I was just wondering how important do you think newspapers are, how instrumental they will be in the changing attitudes towards women and female equality? I mean, one big example is the Page 3 campaign, which has just resurfaced again. Um, but how, how important do you think the press will be in regulating how the attitudes towards women, particularly when things like advertising still objectifies on a daily basis? Well, uh, yeah, it's a huge influence. It's not the influence that, that it was, I don't think, to be honest. Um, and it, and it, yeah, it's changing. 
I think newspapers are way behind the culture a lot of the time in that stuff. I think they are in issues of sexuality, ethnicity. I think that, uh, you know, uh, as Kurt said, you know, you, you need to sit in the newsroom and look around and see a kind of mixture of people. And, and that's only just starting to happen. So it's way behind, and so that's, that's what you'll get. But there are certain, uh, you know, it's... And one, on the one hand, you've got to keep pushing for these things and the kind of cultural politics and the feminism that you want to see. And on the other hand, another part of newspapers is to entertain as well as inform. So, you, you know, you're going to find a mixture. You know, as much as people don't want to hear it, you know, the biggest female readership and 40% of people who vote Labour is the Daily Mail. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't make people very happy to hear that, but it's, you know, it's true. So... There's all broadsheets would love to have the female readership figures of, of the male, for instance. Now, how do they do that? Well, they do it with, you know, if you, you know, if you have, if you have a job, you're probably going to have cancer if you're a woman. You know, they do. There's endless stories, but people, you know, it, it doesn't stop people wanting to read the rest of the paper. So. But yeah, I, I think, I think it is getting better. I don't want to end on that negative note. Oh, that's very good <laughs> to end on a positive note, as always. And uh, perhaps, you know, if newspapers are dying a slow death, at least that will get rid of page three, if nothing else does. Uh, Suzanne, thank you so much for coming back. It was a real pleasure to have you here and uh, giving your wisdom and insight in all those years practicing out there as a journalist, having graduated from this esteemed organ institution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.